The scene in today's Gospel follows upon Peter's confession of faith at Caesarea Philippi, when Peter said to Jesus, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. At this point, Jesus foretells his passion. St. Matthew shows us Christ foretelling his passion and his death no less than three times. Though Peter has confessed Jesus as the Son of God and the Messiah, Peter does not yet grasp the full implications of the faith he has professed. He is genuinely shocked by Jesus' words about his suffering and death, saying, God forbid, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Peter is for us the figure of the believer, a man of lively faith who still does not immediately understand everything and sometimes stumbles in living this faith. Jesus sharply rebukes Peter for thinking of Christ's mission in purely human terms. The cross was the very purpose of our Savior's coming. In speaking of Christ's mission, Archbishop Fulton Sheen put it this way, Every other person who ever came into this world came into it to live. Jesus Christ came into it to die. The scripture describes him as the Lamb, slain as it were from the beginning of the world. It was not so much that his birth cast a shadow on his life and thus led to his death, it was rather that the cross was first and cast its shadow back to Christ's birth. Jesus now says to Peter, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The kingdom of Christ and the truth of Christ are very different from the kingdoms and the wisdom of this world. As St. Paul says to the Corinthians, The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. God's truth in Christ can only be known by revelation and accepted in faith on the basis of the authority of God himself. To bring us into his kingdom, God has spoken to us by both words and deeds, recorded in the Bible and handed down and interpreted by tradition. God's plan for us, as known in the scriptures, is called salvation history. It is the story of the redemption of mankind in Christ. Everything in the Bible converges on the cross of Christ as the unifying center. As the letter to the Hebrews says, In many and various ways God spoke of old to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by a son whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. Some people try to read the Bible, and they find things that seem strange, or disturbing, or hard to understand. Then they give up on the Bible, and even question whether this is really God's true inspired word. The problem is that, apart from Christ, they lack the key to the Bible's interpretation. Those who give up on the Bible are interrupting God and won't let God finish speaking. Jesus Christ is God's final word, God's ultimate self-revelation in visible human flesh. St. John says in his prologue that in Jesus Christ, God the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. We have beheld his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. These are the key words, grace and truth. 
The Christian gospel is not something that we have figured out for ourselves, but rather a revelation from on high, given in human words, for our sake. We receive divine truth on God's terms, and in the words that God himself has clothed that truth. Doctrine matters because truth matters, and because truth and grace are inseparable in Christ, as St. John tells us. Let me read you a famous passage from the Acts of the Apostles about the life of the earliest Christian community in Jerusalem. And they devoted themselves to the Apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of the bread and the prayers. This passage tells us that the earliest believers valued apostolic teaching, that is, what we call Christian doctrine. Sound doctrine was inseparable for them from the breaking of the bread, that is, the Eucharist, and from personal and liturgical prayer. Christian faith was to be lived out in worship and charity and witness under apostolic guidance. Now, no one should think that knowing sound doctrine is enough to bring one to heaven. We need not only faith, but also hope and love in order to go to heaven. Knowledge by itself will not do it. Only Jesus Christ, dwelling within us by charity, can save us. As St. Paul says to the Corinthians, If I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love or charity, I am nothing. Then why is it important to know Catholic doctrine? The great Catholic apologist Frank Sheed explained this very well in three points. First of all, because truth is worth knowing for its own sake. Knowledge serves love by removing misunderstandings that stand in the way of love, and by answering questions and doubts that may undermine the love of God. Second, every truth learned about God is a new reason and basis for loving God. Third, because as Christians, we are to be instruments of the grace of Christ our Redeemer and witnesses to his truth. Like the earliest Christians in Jerusalem, we need to know right doctrine in order to share God's truth with others. As St. Paul says to the Romans, How are men to call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without a preacher? Ignorance is not bliss in religion or in anything else. The Penny Catechism has this famous question, Why did God make you? The Catechism ans answer is this, and no one has ever improved upon it. God made me to know him, to love him, and to serve him in this world, and to be happy with him forever in the next.